The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain Chapter 38 Making them pens was a distressing tough job, and so was the saw, and Jim allowed the inscription was going to be the toughest of all. That's the one which the prisoner has to scrabble on the wall. But he had to have it. Tom said he got to. There warn't no case of a state prisoner not scrabbling his inscription to leave behind, and his coat of arms. "'Look at Lady Jane Grey,' he says. "'Look at Guilford Dudley. Look at old Northumberland. Why, Huck, suppose it is considerable trouble. What you going to do? How you going to get around it?' Jim's got to do his inscription and coat of arms. They all do. Jim says, Why, Mars Tom, I hain't got no coat of arm. I hain't got nothing but dis year old shirt, and you knows I got to keep the journal on dat. Oh, you don't understand, Jim. A coat of arms is very different. Well, I says, Jim's right, anyway, when he says he ain't got no coat of arms, because he hain't. "'I reckon I knowed that,' Tom says. "'But you bet he'll have one before he goes out of this. Because he's going out right, and there ain't going to be no flaws in his record.' So whilst me and Jim filed away at the pens on a brick bat apiece, Jim a-making his'n out of the brass, and I making mine out of the spoon, Tom set to work to think out the coat of arms. By and by he said he'd struck so many good ones he didn't hardly know which to take. But there was one which he reckoned he'd decide on. He says, On the scutcheon we'll have a bend oar in the dexter base, a saltire murray in the fess, with a dog couchon for common charge, and under his foot a chain embattled for slavery, with a chevron vert in a chief engrailed, and three invected lines on a field azure, with the nombral points rampant on a danset indented, crest a runaway nigger, sable, with his bundle over his shoulder on a bar sinister, and a couple of ghouls for supporters, which is you and me, motto, Maggiore Freta, Minore Otto. Got it out of a book. Means the more haste, the less speed. "'Gee, Willikins!' I says. "'But what does the rest of it mean?' "'We ain't got no time to bother over that,' he says. "'We got to dig in like all get out.' "'Well, anyway,' I says, "'what's some of it? What's a fess?' "'A fess is... a, f a fess... a fess is... You don't need to know what a fess is. I'll show him how to make it when he gets to it. Shucks, Tom, I says. I think you might tell a person. What's a bar sinister? Oh, I don't know, but he's got to have it. All the nobility does. <sighs> that was just his way. If it didn't suit him to explain a thing to you, he wouldn't do it. You might pump at him a week. It would make no difference. He'd got all that coat of arms business fixed, so now he started in to finish up the rest of that part of the work, which was to plan out a mournful inscription. Said Jim got to have one, like they all done. He made up a lot, wrote them out on a paper, and read them off so. 1. Here a captive heart busted. 2. Here a poor prisoner, forsook by the world and friends, fretted his sorrowful life. 3. Here a lonely heart broke, and a worn spirit went to its rest after thirty-seven years of solitary captivity. 4. Here, homeless and friendless, after thirty-seven years of bitter captivity, perished a noble stranger, natural son of Louis the Fourteenth. Tom's voice trembled whilst he was reading them, and he most broke down. When he got done he could no way make up his mind which one for Jim to scrabble on to the wall. They was all so good. But at last he allowed he would let him scrabble them all on. Jim said it would take him a year to scrabble such a lot of truck on to the logs with a nail, and he didn't know how to make them letters besides. 
but Tom said he would block them out for him, and then he wouldn't have nothing to do but just follow the lines. Then pretty soon he says, Come to think, the logs ain't a-going to do. They don't have log walls in a dungeon. We got to dig the inscriptions into a rock. We'll fetch a rock. Jim said the rock was worse than the logs. He said it would take him such a poison long time to dig them into a rock he wouldn't ever get out. But Tom said he would let me help him do it. Then he took a look to see how me and Jim was getting along with the pens. It was most pesky, tedious, hard work and slow, and didn't give my hands no show to get well of the sores, and we didn't seem to make no headway, hardly. So Tom says, I know how to fix it. We got to have a rock for the coat of arms and mournful inscriptions, and we can kill two birds with that same rock. There's a gaudy big grindstone down at the mill, and we'll smooch it, and carve the things on it and file out the pens and the saw on it, too. It warn't no slouch of an idea, and it warn't no slouch of a grindstone, nother, but we allowed we'd tackle it. It warn't quite midnight yet, so we cleared out for the mill, leaving Jim at work. We smooched the grindstone, and set out to roll her home, but it was a most nation-tough job. Sometimes, do what we could, we couldn't keep her from falling over, and she come mighty near mashing us every time. Tom said she was going to get one of us sure before we got through. We got her half way, and then we was plumb played out, and most drowned with sweat. We see it warn't no use, we got to go and fetch Jim. So he raised up his bed and slid the chain off of the bed leg, and wrapped it round and round his neck and we crawled out through our hole and down there, and Jim and me laid into that grindstone and walked her along like nothing, and Tom superintended. He could out-superintend any boy I ever see. He knowed how to do everything. Our hole was pretty big, but it warn't big enough to get the grindstone through. But Jim, he took the pick and soon made it big enough. Then Tom marked out them things on it with the nail, and set Jim to work on them, with the nail for a chisel, and an iron bolt from the rubbish and the lean-to for a hammer, and told him to work till the rest of his candle quit on him, and then he could go to bed, and hide the grindstone under his straw tick, and sleep on it. Then we helped him fix his chain back on the bed-leg, and was ready for bed ourselves. But Tom thought of something, and says, "'You got any spiders in here, Jim?' No, sir, thanks to goodness I hain't, Mars Tom. All right, we'll get you some. But bless you, honey, I don't want none. I's afeard of em. I just soon have rattlesnakes around. Tom thought a minute or two and says, It's a good idea, and I reckon it's been done. It must have been done. It stands to reason. Yes, it's a prime good idea. Where could you keep it? Keep what, Mars Tom? Why, a rattlesnake. The goodness gracious alive, Mars Tom. Why, if there was a rattlesnake to come in here, I'd take and bust right out through that log wall, I would, with my head. Why, Jim, you wouldn't be afraid of it after a little. You could tame it. Tame it? Yes, easy enough. Every animal is grateful for kindness and petting, and they wouldn't think of hurting a person that pets them. Any book will tell you that. You try, that's all I ask. Just try for two or three days. Why, you can get him so in a little while that he'll love you, and sleep with you, and won't stay away from you a minute, and will let you wrap him round your neck and put his head in your mouth. Please, Mars Tom, don't talk so. I can't stand it. He'd let me shove his head in my mouth for a favor, ain't it? I lay he'd wait a powerful long time for I asked him. And more than that, I don't want him to sleep with me. Jim, don't act so foolish. A prisoner's got to have some kind of a dumb pet. And if a rattlesnake hasn't ever been tried, why, there's more glory to be gained in your being the first to ever try it 
than any other way you could ever think of to save your life. Why, Mars Tom, I don't want no such glory. Snake take and bite Jim's chin off, then where is the glory? No, sir, I don't want no such doings. Blame it, can't you try? I only want you to try. You needn't keep it up if it don't work. But the trouble all done if the snake bite me while I's a-tryin' him. Mars Tom, I'm willin' to tackle most anything that ain't unreasonable. But if you and Huck fetches a rattlesnake in here for me to tame, I's going to leave that shore. Well, then, let it go, let it go, if you're so bull-headed about it. We can get you some garter snakes, and you can tie some buttons on their tails, and let on their rattlesnakes, and I reckon that'll have to do. I can stand them, Mars Tom, but blame if I couldn't get along without em. I tell you that. I never knowed before it was so much bother and trouble to be a prisoner. Well, it always is when it's done right. You got any rats round here? No, sir, I ain't seen none. Well, we'll get you some rats. Why, Mars Tom, I don't want no rats. Days the damp blamest creatures to disturb a body and rustle round over em and bite his feet when he's trying to sleep I ever see. No, sir, give me garter snakes if I's got to have em, but don't give me no rats. I ain't got no use for em scarcely. But, Jim, you got to have em. They all do. So don't make no more fuss about it. Prisoners ain't ever without rats. There ain't no instance of it. And they train them and pet them and learn them tricks, and they get to be as sociable as flies. But you got to play music to them. You got anything to play music on? I ain't got nothing but a coarse comb and a piece of paper and a juice harp, but I reckon they wouldn't take no stock in a juice harp. Yes, they would. They don't care what kind of music tis. A Jew's harp's plenty good enough for a rat. All animals like music. In a prison they dote on it. Especially painful music. And you can't get no other kind out of a Jew's harp. It always interests them. They come out to see what's the matter with you. Yes, you're all right. You're fixed very well. You want to sit on your bed nights before you go to sleep, and early in the mornings, and play your Jew's harp. Play The Last Link is Broken. That's the thing that'll scoop a rat quicker than anything else. And when you've played about two minutes, you'll see all the rats, and the snakes, and spiders, and things begin to feel worried about you, and come, and they'll just fairly swarm over you, and have a noble good time. Yes, they will, I reckon, Mars Tom, but what kind of time is Jim having? Blessed if I can see the point. But I'll do it if I got to. I reckon I'd better keep the animals satisfied and not have no trouble in the house. Tom waited to think it over and see if there weren't nothing else, and pretty soon he says, Oh, there's one thing I forgot. Could you raise a flower here, do you reckon? I don't know, but maybe I could, Mars Tom. But it's tolerable dark in here, and I ain't got no use for no flower no how, and she'd be a powerful sight of trouble. Well, you try it anyway. Some other prisoners has done it. One or dem big cattail looking mullen stalks would grow in here, Mars Tom, I reckon, but she wouldn't be worth half the trouble she'd cost. Don't you believe it. We'll fetch you a little one, and you plant it in the corner over there, and raise it. And don't call it mullen, call it pitchiola. That's its right name when it's in a prison. And you want to water it with your tears. Why, I got plenty of spring water, Mars Tom. You don't want spring water. You want to water it with your tears. It's the way they always do. Why, Mars Tom, I lay I can raise one of dem mullen stalks twice with spring water whilst another man's a startin' one with tears. That ain't the idea. You got to do it with tears. She'll die on my hands, Mars Tom. She surely will. Cause I don't scarcely ever cry. So Tom was stumped. 
but he studied it over and then said Jim would have to worry along the best he could with an onion. He promised he would go to the nigger cabins and drop one, private, in Jim's coffee pot in the morning. Jim said he would just as soon have tobacco in his coffee, and found so much fault with it, and with the work and bother of raising the mullen, and Jews harping the rats, and petting and flattering up the snakes and spiders and things, on top of all the other work he had to do on pens and inscriptions and journals and things, which made it more trouble and worry and responsibility to be a prisoner than anything he ever undertook, that Tom most lost all patience with him, said he was just loading down with more gaudier chances than a prisoner ever had in the world to make a name for himself, and yet he didn't know enough to appreciate them, and they was just about wasted on him. So Jim he was sorry, and said he wouldn't behave so no more, and then me and Tom shoved for bed. End of chapter.